I think uh, I will ask uh, Professor Cornu and Professor Lachdan, Professor Cornu first, to give a word on behalf of the French speaking uh, North Surgical Society, and yeah. then Professor Lachdan. Thank you, uh, Professor Dahouaboui. I'm very pleased to be with you all. I should say good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, as we are all uh, together display around the earth. Uh, we have the great pleasure tonight to have uh, two very nice conferences and uh, I'm also very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Michel Bojanowski from the University of Montreal and uh, also uh, Professor uh, Angelo Scolias uh, who is uh, chairing the Young uh, Neurosurgeon Committee for the WFNS. So thank you for everyone. And uh, we can, I give uh, also uh, to my colleague and great friend, Professor El Azari, uh, who will give some words of introduction. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Philippe. But uh, I, you know that I can't uh, speak before our president, Professor Lahdar. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I will Sorry. speak af after him, no problem, Professor so Lahdar. Professor Lahda, who is the president of the Moroccan Society of Neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Corny. Thank you, Professor Azhari. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the organization, uh, the organization of uh, this uh, joint webinar. And I would thank especially Dr. Darqawi, uh, one of the young neurosurgeons of our society. He is very active and uh, very uh, he, he works uh, a lot in uh, to to organize this especially this webinar, all the webinars but especially this webinar. I'll thank uh, Professor Bojanovsky, our uh, guest speaker, uh, for accepting to give the, the lecture and also for having attended the, the majority of our webinars. And uh, Professor Roger Descolias. Uh, from the Young Neurosurgeon and the President of the Young Neurosurgeon Committee uh, of the w WFNS. Uh, I'll thank also all the panelists, Professor Azhari, Professor Malhawi, and Professor uh, Sanusi, and Professor Amro Habib, uh, the past president of the Young Neurosurgeon Committee. Uh, so, welcome and uh, thank you for. All the organization and all, all the attendees and the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lahdar. Um, I think uh, uh, first I say good evening to everyone. So and uh, maybe in uh, in uh, Montreal is uh, also uh, is still good morning. Uh, so uh, welcome to the joint webinar of the Moroccan Society of Neurosurgery and the French Speaking Neurosurgical Society, organizing the of the WFNS Young uh, Neurosurgeon Forum. Me and Dr. Mustafa Hamama are pleased to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the board of the Moroccan Society of Neurosurgery. Uh, please allow me, dear colleagues, uh, to welcome our panelists from the Kingdom of uh, Saudi Arabia, my colleague and dear friend, Habib. He is the president of the Saudi Arabia Neurosurgical Society, the famous SANS, head of the Department of Neurosurgery in Riyadh and past chairman of the WFNS, the Neurosurgeon Forum, where I met him and worked uh, together for uh, two years. And uh, welcome, Professor Amro. And uh, welcome from Niger to Professor Samuel Lassanusi, well-known pioneer of African neurosurgery, president of the Niger National Society, and the president of African Regional Society, Dana Ansa, and vice president of the CANS. He is the, the program of neurosurgery in, uh, in Niger, and also the head of the department of neurosurgery in Miami, and chief of the department of neurosurgery of surgery at the Med School of uh, uh, Miami. Welcome also to the, our famous neurosurgeon uh, from Morocco, Professor Absamad Azari, FNS Medal of Honor for education in 2017 and only president of the CANS and past president of the Moroccan Society of Neurosurgery and mentor of many neurosurgeons in Morocco. He's also current, the current president of the FNS 
and the South African Federation of Political Societies and General Secretary of the French Speaking Neurological Society. And is, he is the chairman of the neurosurgery training program of Mohammed uh, Six Movie Hospital, Sheikh Khalifa in Casablanca. And last but not least, uh, Professor Adil Melhawi, one of the pioneer and unique team of neuro radiosurgery in Morocco. He is the head of uh, emergency department of Hospital Specialty of Rabat, member of the board of Cervastic Surgery Diploma and uh, uh, past treasurer of the Moroccan Society of Neurosurgery. Welcome all, and thank you for accepting our invitation to share this webinar. I think it's time, if you allow me, uh, Mr. President, uh, to start our first talk. Our first guest speaker is uh, Dr. Angelo Scolias, chair of the WFNS uh, Young Neurosurgery Forum Committee. I have the pleasure to meet Dr. Angelo Scolias in WFNS uh, uh, Committee, where we shared many ideas and activities. Dr. Angela Scolias is a clinical lecturer in neurosurgery at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Clinical Neuroscience. Edinburgh Hospital in Cambridge, UK. He is interested by neurotrauma, Ontario school base, and pituitary surgery and spine surgery, and also in, is in the methodology of clinical neurosurgical research, particularly trials and global neurosurgery. We can see that in as he is the co-investigator of the famous RISPU DH study about uh, carnitomy for acute subdural hematoma and also the dexamethasone for uh, chronic subdural hematoma. And today, uh, today as the current chairman of WFNS, I will ask, uh, of, I, I, I mean, the past chairman of WFNS uh, committee, uh, the committee, I will ask Professor Amr Habib, the chair, to give the mic then to the OGS colleagues. Dr. Amr. So um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Qadr Qawi, for this uh, invitation and gathering. I think what's so peculiar about this webinar is um, inviting the Young Neurosurgeons Forum and getting this forum introduced to young neurosurgeons in Africa. And um, I think the forum has a lot to offer, especially that uh, Dr. Angelus has taken over the leadership. And I don't know why since he became the chairman of this committee, he's losing weight. I, I'm not sure is it his work or is it the committee's work, but uh, he's, he's been doing a fantastic job uh, be sure about that. And uh, I'm learning along the process. So without uh, uh, further delay, I will give the mic to Angelus. Please go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Amru and, and Fad. And also my thanks to the um, coordinators of this webinar. Um, thanks to the French speaking in your surgical site and also the Moroccan in your surgical site for the kind uh, invitation. Um, uh, you know, as, as Samra said, I think it's very nice for us to be uh, part of this webinar um, today uh, because our aim is for our um, committee to be useful to young neurosurgeons worldwide. Uh, and this obviously includes um, Africa, but also the other continents. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to, to present um, in this forum today. And I'll... Um, so I discussed with Fad as to what I should um, discuss in this webinar, and we thought that maybe a progress report um, of what we have done in the last three years would be, would be useful. Um, so this is not supposed to be an exhaustive um, uh, talk about what we have done, but it's just an overview of our um, achievements. Um, so um, the our committee um, the aims of our committee is to represent and promote the interests of young neurosurgeons worldwide. And we define young neurosurgeons by residents, trainees, fellows, and also we include fully qualified neurosurgeons um, up to 10 years from the end of their residency. Um, and in terms of what we aim to do, we want to be the advocates and also we um, want to support young neurosurgeons in terms of developing their knowledge, surgical skills, research skills, and also uh, career opportunities. Uh, and as I said, we want to represent young neurosurgeons globally. Um, in terms of our um, uh, members, so um, currently we have 32 members from around the world. And we have uh, eight members from Africa, eight from America, eight from Asia, and eight from Europe. So at the moment it's pretty equally distributed. 
And we're actually very happy to uh, that 4% of our committee members are currently uh, women. Uh, I think this is something that we need to, to try and work um, to improve in, in your surgery in general. Uh, and our committee is, is actually really, really happy to have um, um, several women amongst our uh, ranks. And you can see our members um, on this um, um, scrolling screenshot. Uh, and um, uh, as, as Amro said, I became the chair uh, since September 2019, so since the Beijing WFNS meeting, he was the, the, the previous um, chairman from 2017 to, to 2019. So many of the things that I'm going to present to you, um, it's actually due to Amro's uh, work in the last couple of years. So in terms of our um, strategy, um, and we have divided this in four um, domains. So um, knowledge, and this is in terms of um, uh, courses, meetings, webinars that we can deliver, and also web-based conferences, then surgical skills. And we are thinking about specifically um, courses, um, simulation courses, and also other webinars potentially, uh, research skills. And I will explain why this is quite important uh, later on. And also career development, uh, more specifically fellowships, uh, and also potentially a program of mentoring. Um, so I will tackle each one of those in, in turn. So um, the, I think the highlight of our um, work in the last couple of years has been the webinar program. So this was initiated in May 20, 2018 under um, AMRO's uh, leadership and also with Ahmed. Uh, Al Mari, who is a resident in Saudi, uh, Faith Robertson, who is now the secretary of our um, committee, has now taken over running this program. Uh, but this has done quite well. So we now have a very um, uh, good library in the YouTube WFNS channel. Uh, we have uh, 700 subscribers, a library of 17 videos, and they've attracted in total eight and a half thousand views. Um, and these are just some of the recent uh, talks, um, as you can see there. So we have various topics from surgical approaches to global neurosurgery, how to write a paper. Uh, and more recently, we had some talks on the uh, pandemic. So ethical, ethical challenges during the pandemic, for example, given by uh, Arik Brockman. Um, and as I said, this is our um, YouTube library. So please do, do become a subscriber. And this way you can get notified whenever we upload a new video. Um, uh, moving on to the, the surgical skills. So I think this is obviously really, really important. We are um, surgeons, so we need to be striving to develop our um, surgical skills continuously. And we are actually very uh, lucky that um, we are collaborating with the uh, App Surgeon, which is uh, actually, uh, it's a spin-out company of the, uh, based in Milan, uh, founded by a, a neurosurgeon. His name is Federico Nicolosi, who is actually a member of our committee. And this um, spin-out company has now been funded by the European Commission. And you can see uh, that they have been trying very hard to develop very realistic models. So on the left, you can see, um, a brain model that they have now been trying to uh, develop uh, and actually it does look very realistic and then on the middle and on the right you can see this is a modular simulator so um, it's supposed to be fairly low cost and you can um, do various um, modular approaches so you know uh, if you have somebody who's not very experienced you can just practice the pterogonal craniotomy just taking the bone off uh, and then if you have somebody who is a bit more experienced, you can try getting down to the optic and the carotid. So, so there are various ways um, of, of using this kind of modular simulator. And our aim is to uh, try and run some courses in the next year or so, initially focusing on trainees from low and middle income countries um, to begin with. Um, moving on to the research skills. Um, so, we have a number of, again, a number of efforts. Um, so one is training and uh, Ignatius Asen, who is the, uh, the chair of the Young African Neurosurgeons, um, has now initiated uh, a series of webinars on research methodology. We have also collaborated with the ENS Research Committee on Research Courses uh, and also the BMJ Learning Program, and I will present this in a minute. And we have also given the opportunity to um, young neurosurgeons to participate in high quality multi-center projects. And I will mention those briefly later on. So the webinar series, uh, we had the first webinar in fact at the 
uh, beginning of June, and we had uh, Ed Benzel as the invited speaker, and also Ignatius gave a very nice talk, um, but it was a very well attended webinar. And I say we'll have more webinars specifically on the research methods and, and the challenges of those methods in, in neurosurgery. Uh, the um, research publication program, this, uh, uh, this is fully online uh, learning program. And I say this was designed by the British Medical Journal in collaboration with the UCSF. And you can see that this is um, uh, essentially eight courses. So it's things like how to develop and record good questions, write protocols, choosing the best study design, how to do ethical research, how to write a paper, which is really important. The essentials of running a clinical trial, how to pick the right journal and get published, and also avoid scientific misconduct. And all of those eight courses, they have several modules. Um, so as I say, th this can be really, really useful. Um, and it's fully online. And we have actually secured 50 places for young neurosurgeons from uh, low and middle income countries. And this is fully funded. Uh, normally, it costs a fair amount of money. And we'll be circulating the details via the WFNS new newsletter fairly soon. Um, then in terms of the opportunities to take part in high quality research, so this is the Global Neurotrauma Outcome Study, and this was a prospective observational study. So it wasn't a randomized study, it was just observational multicenter of outcomes following emergency surgery for a traumatic brain injury. So this was supported by the WFNS and all continental neurosurgical associations. And um, uh, we, we have now finished with data collection. And uh, in fact, data were collected in close to 200 hospitals in 60 different countries. So we have data on um, about 1,600 patients um, globally, and the data cleaning is currently ongoing. But this is a very, uh, I think, good opportunity for young neurosurgeons to, to take part in this kind of projects. And then you can see here the, uh, the big number of people involved. So we have the um, honorary advisory panel with the presidents and vice presidents of uh, the various continental neurosurgical associations. And then uh, on the right, the protocol development committee. And then also quite a big number of, of young uh, people who were part of the dissemination and um, communication committee. Uh, and I think it's really important to give the opportunity to young neurosurgeons to participate in this type of projects because by doing, you, you can learn. Um, uh, so I think, you know, learning on, on the job, if you like, is, is actually really, really important. Another um, recent opportunity is this, this study, the COVID surge study. And our committee has been supporting these observational studies coordinated by the University of Birmingham. So the COVID surge cohort study was focusing on patients who were um, COVID positive and who were having surgery, uh, just to look at their outcomes. And this study has now been published. I'll, I'll mention this briefly. And then the COVID surge cancer study was looking at patients with um, tumors that need to have an operation during the pandemic. And I think this is a really important question because it's, it's unclear. Uh, I mean, quite a few people have been saying that we should really be reducing the number of operations we do because of the very high risk to patients. And probably there is some truth in that, but I think unless we actually collect the data properly and in a multi-center uh, fashion and prospectively, we don't really know the answer um, to these things. And I'm afraid that I can't really give you the, the results today um, because the paper is currently under uh, review, um, but things um, actually um, in terms of elective patients who are um, COVID negative when they have their operation, uh, things aren't as bad as it is when somebody who is COVID positive is having an operation, as, as you would expect. So this is the, the first paper. So this is the COVID positive patients, uh, as I said, um, and this was published in The Lancet. And you can see, uh, again, the, the large number of people who collaborated here. Uh, but as I say, this was a study that took place in 235 hostels in 24 different countries. Uh, so a huge, a huge effort. Um, and then in terms of the uh, results, um, so this was um, COVID positive patients. Some of them, they had uh, a CT um, scan pre-op or a lab test or a clinical diagnosis. And as you can see, 24% had a pre-op diagnosis, 76% had a post-op diagnosis within the first few days post-op, that is. 
uh, and the third day mortality in that cohort is 24 percent but these are patients patients who are predominantly have been um, uh, emergency or expedited surgery you can see the high rate of pulmonary complications uh, 51 percent and the risk factors for um, mortality so male sex age more than 70 emergency surgery as you would expect um, moving on to career and development so uh, again i think this is really really important and, and many people have been asking for uh, details about fellowships so these are um, the members of our committee working on this uh, it's we have a working group specifically working on fellowships so we have um, um, elizabeth ogan de rivas uh, fad uh, um, as well ron batikulum from the philippines uh, claire karakesi Katrin uh, Rabier from Sweden and Kerry Vaughan from the US. And this working group is trying to provide information on how to pursue a fellowship. I think it's really important actually to try and um, collect the tips and the advice from young neurosurgeons who actually have personal experience and have managed to do this. Um, and this is why we have selected um, these individuals as members of this group. And also we will try to have a database, create a database of fellowships that people can refer to. Um, so in terms of other uh, WFNS um, young neurosurgeons developments, um, so I think communication with young neurosurgeons worldwide is, is really, really important. And we now have a new website uh, and that's the um, uh, address of the website. Uh, I have to thank Ron particular because he's done a fantastic um, job in setting up this website. He's a webmaster. Uh, and please, you know, visit our um, website. It, it's it's still developing, uh, but there is already quite a bit of information in there. And then also our um, Twitter um, channel has at the moment um, close to 1,800 followers. And at some point, we'll probably um, start utilizing Facebook as well. Um, because many people are telling us, that, uh, in fact, Facebook uh, probably is more popular uh, for um, this type of thing. Um, now, um, coming now close to the end of my, of my talk, uh, but this um, is something that actually is very close to my, to my heart. I think um, this was a really nice piece of work that we did with um, uh, AMRO. Uh, so this was a survey, global survey of young neurosurgeons that um, it was initiated in 2018. And it, it's actually now, just now has been published in World Neurosurgery X as, as both papers are open access papers. So actually it's a really big survey of 9, uh, 953 respondents um, from across the globe. Uh, and these are uh, just some of the very interesting results. Um, there is a wealth of data uh, and, you know, I say the paper is open, both papers are open access. So please visit the website of World Neurosurgery and, and have a look. But I just want to highlight some of the issues that people have um, mentioned. So this was a very detailed categorization of respondents' requests for improvement in their current uh, neurosurgical system. And we had um, six, uh, 1,673 uh, individual requests. Uh, this is because uh, people could have more than one request. And you can see that the majority of requests were about uh, research. So research opportunities, research skills, et cetera. And then um, uh, close second and third, education and self-specialty fellowship. And this is why we have, as a committee, we have been paying a lot of attention to uh, research, education, and also um, uh, training. Uh, it's because of this reason. Uh, this was, uh, again, a very... Uh, it was a slightly different question, but we wanted to find out from people what their personal challenges are in uh, their day-to-day -day practice. And again, you can see that the limited opportunities to do research came out on top. Uh, so almost half of the respondents, they thought that the limited opportunities to do research was uh, a barrier in their day-to-day -day practice, that it is a problem for them. And then... Uh, very close second is the limited number of opportunities for hands-on operating. And obviously, this is this a concern. Um, young neurosurgeons and residents, they need to have good opportunities for hands-on operating so that they can then become competent and efficient in operating. 
Uh, and I think we need to look into ways of, of addressing the simulation training is one way, but obviously it's not the only way. Uh, because zone operating is, is really, really important. And then close third, the lack of access to organized teaching and training sessions. And I think during the pandemic, we have seen that people have now started um, addressing this in, in a new way with the webinars like the one that we have today. And uh, personally, I would love to see many of these webinars carrying on in the future. Uh, even when we go back to the usual uh, normal, I, I, I don't see why we should stop doing these webinars. And then 40%, I think um, a lot of people actually, they did mention then, um, and you can say that these both are uh, related, the long hours of work and poor work-life balance. And, and uh, there has been this um, kind of issue that unless you work long hours, then you, you can't really train properly. But I think um, times are changing and probably we need to start looking, at, looking into how we can address these, um, these issues, especially now with a workforce that uh, includes uh, more and more um, women. And I think that we need to look um, uh, into this, this aspect of things. And we have a specific working group um, as part of our committee looking into this. And then you can see that lack of a mentor um, is a problem. Lack of regular access to the advice of experienced senior colleagues is a problem. So we need to be looking into addressing this. And also lack of access to neurosurgical journals. Uh, interestingly, bullying and harassment issues, which in general, if you look at social media, people mention, talk about this kind of thing a lot in medicine, not in neurosurgery, but in medicine in general. Uh, actually, it's not reported by many, it's, it's 13%. But obviously, you know, again, it's important to, to, to address um, this um, whenever it is a problem. So, um, and I say we use this survey to now form working groups uh, and these working groups have been, the formation of these groups have, has been informed by the survey results. So we have working groups on research opportunities, surgical skills and simulation, education and also a curriculum development, work-life balance, access to journals, mentoring and fellowships. And, and I think that it's really uh, nice to see how these, the, the work of these working groups is developing and, and will continue developing hopefully and will produce something useful by the end of the term of our um, committee. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just aware that I've, I've been talking for some time, so I, I really want to wrap this up now. I think to conclude, um, our committee is aimed to support young researchers globally. Uh, and, and when I say globally, I really do mean this. I, uh, I, I personally uh, strongly believe in um, the concept of global neurosurgery and improving um, neurosurgical care for all those who need it uh, worldwide. Uh, we have an ongoing program of activities uh, looking at education, surgical skills, research and career development. Please visit our website, as I said, and follow our um, YouTube and Twitter um, channels. Uh, in terms of uh, people to thank, um, obviously, uh, Franco Servaday has been very supportive from day one for our committee, and David Adelson, the coordinator of all committee's activities, Amro as the immediate past chair, uh, Ignatius, who is my co-chair, Kerry Vaughan, the vice chair, Faith Robertson, secretary, Ron Batikil on the webmaster, and all members of our REM committee that you can see um, on the right side of the screen. Um, so thank you very much, and I'd, like, um, I'd be very happy to take any questions now or um, in the end. Up. Thank you, Angelos. Thank you. I have a question, but uh, we will give uh, the, the first for a panelist if they have question. And I will ask you after perhaps uh, Samuel Adil or, or uh, our uh, colleague. Uh, uh, is there some question from the panelist? I have one question waiting the, the other question uh, is there so when we when we were uh, young neurosurgeons i remember we went to the europe especially maghreb and west africa we went to to france or Be belgium belgium uh, to uh, complete our 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 education in neurosurgery so it was really uh, the education in the hospital there is no machine for uh, for uh, uh, as you as you show us uh, for uh, 
to brain uh, in, in plastic or something. It was really in the patient and in the laboratory with anatomic uh, uh, dissection and cadaver. My, my question is, globalization is very, very, very nice. It's very, really, it's, uh, it's really uh, human, human education. But do you think that what you are, you are doing we, in some countries, what uh, WFNS is doing in some countries, I, I can give example for Scandinavia and for example, for in, in Africa or in Asia. They, they, we haven't the same, the same material we have. I think the goal of WFN, WFNS is to, to, uh, to find solution to make the same, the same tools in, in, in Europe, in Asia, in America, or in Africa, in order to make uh, uniformity of, of education. What do you think about, about that? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's a good um, point that you make. Uh, and I think having, uh, I think that you're referring to having a uniform uh, yeah, you know, minimum I mean, curriculum for uh, neurosurgery. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think that's a good idea. And, you know, as you know, ma in many countries, there are already curriculums um, and syllabus for uh, neurosurgery in, in existence. So, you, you know, there is one in the UK, um, you know, I'm sure there is one in, in the US and, and Canada. So pre-specified syllabus and curriculum. Uh, but in many countries, um, one doesn't exist. And, and this isn't specifically low and middle income countries, it's even high income countries that don't have a a specific curriculum for neurosurgery, it's up to the departmental chairman to, to come up with a curriculum. And I think that you're right. I think the WFNS, um, and more specifically, the Education Committee, for example, could, could play a role in coming up with uh, a universal um, neurosurgical curriculum for training. Uh, I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, machine of, of simulation. In my hospital, they, they looked for one machine for a simulation for endoscopy, and the price is $100,000. It's really very expensive, the machine of simulation. So that, yeah. that is why it's perhaps uh, there is some problem, some problem to, to, to get this material. Yeah, so I, I, I'm fully aware of this. And in, in fact, one of the reasons that we have partnered with the upsurgeon uh, company that I mentioned, which is, uh, it's, you know, I say it was founded by uh, neurosurgeons, was that from what we know, it's actually a very low cost simulator. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I I, I, I can't go into the details of the exact prices because I'm not aware of those at the moment. Uh, but I think it's uh, below a um, uh, thousand euros dollars, you know, to, to run a course uh, per participant. And, you know, you don't have to have uh, uh, the issues around cadavers and all those things. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be a lot more uh, straightforward, I think. But I say this is something that we want to try. We haven't tried it yet. And uh, we'll be looking to uh, run a couple of pilot courses to see how this, this can work. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I fully agree that low cost simulators is, is very much needed because 100,000 pounds, that's, that's not good, is it? Okay, thank you. There's a question from the panelist. I do have... Uh, Am Amro, Amro? Yeah, I do have some comments. Uh, I mean, the, the Young Neurosurgeons Forum is not there to replace the standard training. Um, uh, I believe that... <clears throat> The WFNS has already a committee that is looking at the way to put a standard for neurosurgery training worldwide. Um, the second point, I, I do believe strongly, like you, Professor Azari, about um, the importance of cadaver training. And I really love cadaver training personally. And the forum would love to collaborate uh, internationally to accommodate young neurosurgeons, and we can advertise for that. Uh, and bring um, candidates to participate in these courses worldwide. Um, um, I, I, I think uh, I see simulation all over the place and people want to try it and we have not tried it uh, as Angela said, but I would encourage young neurosurgeons 
to uh, download the application of um, the upsurgence is, is beautiful. It is free. Uh, you can um, segment and separate every piece of skull bones, whether in the skull base or in the convexity or whether you go transnasal or occipital, you can spin it around, you can uh, put um, identification uh, names on it. It's beautiful and uh, it is free. Uh, so this is a tool that residents can use to learn their skull base anatomy. Um, and yeah, we will have more on the, on the website to come about the courses. And if you do have courses, please, we have representative all around the world. Uh, just let us know and we're happy to advertise it. Thank you. Adil? Yes, I just wanted to congratulate the both uh, past and present presidents for their uh, great work and all what is done. But uh, I'm sure that uh, regarding what you were saying, I'm meaning to reach uh, everybody, maybe since it's a WFNS uh, organization, uh, most of the information is going through the, uh, the societies and maybe not reaching the, you know, the base uh, and uh, reaching all the, the young. So I'm happy to see that there are many youngs I know that are involved and this is very nice to see from everywhere, but maybe to reach the, the base, uh, maybe uh, FAD or any representative in any country can have like a mailing list that uh, can you can uh, really directly reach everybody so that the YouTube channel, all what you are doing can be uh, really much accepted because if you look 700 uh, on the YouTube channel, maybe uh, you are still not uh, uh, reaching everybody or missing a lot of people, but uh, it's great uh, work that uh, I think everybody should be involved in, and especially the youngest. So we have with us uh, the representative of uh, West Africa, Samula. Have you comment, Samula? Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity given to African neurosurgeons. Uh, I want to say that uh, about uh, uh, stimulators, I think it is the best way because the, the cadaveric training is difficult because we don't have cadavers for in my country, in, in so many countries in Africa, we have for religious considerations, it's not possible to have cadaver. So I think the future for us will be simulators. Uh, if it's, uh, it's not very expensive, and I hope that uh, in few years, it will not be expensive. So it will help us to continue uh, the, the training for young neurosurgeons. So I think uh, the cadavers is the best way, but we, we, we have to be realist here. We'll never, we will never have cadavers for, for training. Thank you. Thank you. In Najia, uh, you want to... I see that you are asking... Yes. Uh, <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We are so sorry because we just finished our webinar with women. Webinar, so I just uh, heard a little bit of your talk, uh, uh, Colin, and I congratulate you. As uh, usual, you are very, very. Uh, 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 you do a lot, lot of things. I do. I know that uh, because uh, one of the young neurosurgeon who working with you, it's my. Uh, my assistant, Dr. Delkawi, and uh, I know that uh, this webinar he is uh, organizing uh, with the professor as, uh, as Harry with you. And I would like to just uh, emphasize something about the uh, genius or uh, uni uniform the curriculum. We had in Belgrade, in Belgrade, if uh, my, uh, my many others. Uh, attend this uh, this uh, we, this uh, session the session was uh, uh, was organized by our chairman Isabel Germano it's about the curriculum around the world and we tried uh, together uh, to have one it's i know 
not easy. It's not easy to have one around the world because uh, in USA is different from Europe, from uh, Africa, or from. Uh, we have to start by uh, every continent to have uh, their own uh, curriculum. For example, in Africa, we have some uh, uh, young neurosurgeon who who's, uh, are, uh, was, uh, of course, training in the North Africa, in the in the East Africa and West Africa. So we need to uh, in, in each uh, unify our uh, our 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 work and to have the same curriculum. Um, uh, speaking about for some. Uh, some countries, anglophone countries, to be uh, have uh, their uh, training in Africa. It's only this, uh, you know, this. Uh, differences can uh, can be can be in, could be in the future a problem for uh, for some uh, uh, trainees when they when they come back to their their country and to have uh, equivalence in their country. So it uh, it uh, at, at Almost of, for this reason, we need to uh, unify this uh, this uh, curriculum. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Najia. There's some question. Just I just must tell that I like the idea that the, the fact that we please Michel that we should share maybe more our res teaching resources, and maybe we. We have to look at this and uh, share a little bit more our resources for teaching by inviting sometimes young neurosurgeon or uh, or uh, students for uh, for a while for teach something to them. Hmm. Okay, we have uh, we have with us Professor Hamdishi is the pioneer of uh, uh, education in in Morocco and also in Africa. Perhaps one comment, and after that, I have to ask to Professor Kony as the president of SNSLF. We have as a goals also education of a young neurosurgeon, Philip. So, Professor Hamlishi before and uh, Philip, you can comment uh, this uh, this this topic, please. You heard me? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I I couldn't heard all of the presentation uh, uh, because of the of the. the the, the, today we had a lot of webinars. This is the third one. So the second one extended <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, this is the reason why I couldn't uh, uh, heard the, the presentation uh, on on uh, on uh, simulation and education, which is uh, which is very very of course uh, important. Uh, my my uh, comment, uh, 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 as you are asking me, is. Uh, is regarding the, this problem of uh, of, uh, of lack of the cadaver in our area, uh, either in in, in Africa, and uh, I don't know how about the the, the Middle East. Uh, maybe Dr. Amra can can, can told us, uh, uh, which is which is I think uh, a huge problem. Uh, my. I, I, I learned my, uh, my, uh, my medicine, uh, my anatomy on cadavers uh, uh, and on dissections, and uh, it's, it's not, uh, not, uh, not uh, needed on, uh, only uh, for, uh, for the, the basic uh, uh, knowledge in anatomy uh, at the medical school and during the, the, the residency program, but it's needed for all, uh, all the continuity of, uh, of, uh, of neurosurgery and microsurgery and <clears throat> research in anatomy is the basic in any, in any pathology, uh, uh, starting uh, from the vascular pathology or from skull-based uh, tumors or uh, any uh, even uh, neurological, pure neurological pathology. Uh, so my what I would like to say, uh, my dear uh, 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 Samad, is uh, how to, uh, to, to, to solve this problem, how our young colleagues now who are directing department, who are uh, uh, teaching in different departments, how they can, they can uh, solve this problem. Because it's not, I heard uh, Samuel saying that it's a religious problem. It's absolutely not a religious problem. It's, it's some kind of uh, religious tradition. It's not the religion who is against the, 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 the practice of the autopsy. Absolutely not. Uh, uh, we, we practiced uh, autopsies in, in medical school in Rabat during more than 40 years since the medical school was created in 1960 until uh, the, the, 
the, the beginning of the 19th and then some problems started. And they know that now it's the problem uh, uh, everywhere. And this is for me is, is a really uh, a huge problem. I try to emphasize it many times, but I think that our society and all African societies uh, uh, should absolutely fight to, 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 uh, to, to, to create, I mean, again, the, the lab, the lab of, the, of the anatomy and, uh, and uh, where, we, where, where students, where residents can find cadavers where they can practice. This is my, my advocacy, uh, my dear Abd Samad. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hamlishi. Professor uh, Philippe Cornu. Active le micro, Philippe. Fait, tu peux activer le micro de Monsieur Cornu? Non, il doit le faire tout seul. Alors, please, uh, Professor Cornu. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, we hear you. So again, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Collias for his nice presentation and then congratulate you for what has been done already. Uh, uh, effectively, uh, this French-speaking society is willing to 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 promote, of course, uh, um, a kind of uh, you know track in neurosurgery and to develop uh, in uh, all the countries, but mainly for us uh, in countries that have, are not having all the accessibility to as all all the topics you you have mentioned during your talk. Uh, especially, I think we could, uh, you know, gather around this project and cooperate with you, with your chair committee, and uh, with the chair committee from the French-speaking society also of uh, young neurosurgeons, uh, being together, because I think that uh, uh, what we could do is uh, perhaps to introduce uh, the feasibility to get access to residency uh, throughout uh, all our department. And uh, in the difference, you know, because as, as what has been said before, I think that being uh, for once in the departments that have the means uh, to uh, train young neurosurgeons to educate them and to give them uh, the first step uh, to uh, be uh, on their way to become uh, also uh, uh, neurosurgeons uh, is... Uh, the initial important step for them when they are back in their country, even if they continue on their own field, uh, to, to have, you know, the, the idea and the, and the project that uh, are already constructed for them uh, to carry on and then uh, to come time to time again in this department to get information and then so uh, get to the level uh, for where we are all willing them to, to be uh, once. Thank you, Philippe. There's some uh, question. Well, I, I do have a comment uh, Please, on, on cadavers because we have a long experience in Saudi for cadavers. We have been running for 10 years an annual cadaver course for spine and for skull base. And we are barely able to cover our own residents. Um, and, and, and like you all say, said that it's, um, a cadaver can be expensive, can be exhausting, but um, we're taking a new approach, which is define basic cadaver courses that are necessary for training. So we defined uh, one course is drilling course. So every resident coming to training has to do that course. It's a one day course. And then basic skull base approaches course and an advanced skull base approaches course. So if you define these three courses uh, and then decide at what level of training the resident will go into, then you can start defining, for example, a center of excellence that the residents will fly over and do these three courses during a six years of training. Uh, and one of them can be combined with another. So you can combine a basic skull base approaches course with a drilling course in two days. So um, uh, I don't know which uh, committee in the WFNS can take that lead, but um, uh, in Africa, as an African society, that might work. Uh, we're trying it in our local country, and I think we are seeing good progress. 
you can you can do that on an African level, which is, um, I mean, defined geographically or the way you see appropriate. I mean, that's you understand this much better. You have a long experience with that. So that's that's my my message. Thank you, thank you. I want I want to thank uh, Angelos for this uh, very nice presentation and for uh, all panelists and uh, colleagues for the discussion. Which it's very interesting, and uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, we have to make some parts of education for young neurosurgeons. So I think that Fahd will perhaps continue in this way, and it should be uh, very very interesting for all of us. Thank you, Angelos, again. Right. And uh, you, now we are much going much. to the second part, and uh, the the question is: one one patient is uh, in consultation with uh, some disease. Big, big malformation or or some uh, skull based uh, pathology which is difficult to to, to, to to treat the patient is waiting us uh, to find the solution sometimes uh, sometimes they ask surgery or radio surgery or, or drugs or everything so we have with us uh, today uh, professor Michel Bujanovsky from Montreal Canada he will talk about brain, uh, brain uh, mal uh, mal uh, uh, cavernous malformation of uh, brain stem. It's very difficult subject and it's really a big problem. And sometimes it's difficult to, 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 to answer to the family of the patient and to propose some things. And uh, uh, before I will present Professor Michel Bujanovsky, uh, I met him as I met all colleagues in French speaking society in Paris with the RAP, Réunion Annuelle de Paris, which held every December. So, uh, Professor uh, Bujanovsky is uh, from Montreal, and uh, we share the same patients. Uh, if, I, if I love to, to go to the far north, he, he loves to go far north and far south. So, really, he is. Uh, uh, as we say in French, a citoyen du monde. Uh, and his, uh, all his qualities, human qualities, make him friend of everybody in French speaking society and all over the world. Dr. Uh, Michel, uh, Professor Michel Bujanovsky is for professor of Department of Surgery at the University of the Montreal and practicing neurosurgery in, in the hospital center of the University Montreal. Graduated in neurosurgery from the University of Montreal, he completed further training in vascular neurosurgery at the Barrow Neurolog Neurological Institute in Arizona. And, you, and uh, I think you know that is the big, big center of vascular surgery in the United States. His area of expertise include vascular surgery and surgery of the, ba the skull base. As director of vascular neurosurgery and skull base surgery of the division, of the University in Montreal, he is also responsible of fellowship program in these fields. He is the director of neurosurgery training program, head of neurosurgery in Montreal, and representative representative of uh, of Canada in French speaking society. For several years, he was responsible to, for teaching ethics to surgical residents at the University of Montreal, and for many years, he, ch he ch chaired the Medical Ev Evaluation Committee of the Department of Surgery. He is the co-author of more than one, 130 papers reviewed in different uh, journals and more than 120 published abstracts and authors of uh, 50, uh, 15 books chapter. He has uh, one numerous teaching awards of the uh, CHU Montreal and University of Montreal. Please, uh, Michel, uh, please tell us what do you think about governor's malformation of brain stem? Thank you very much, Abdesabad. Uh, thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. Uh, please, can you please uh, share, uh, share the screen? Okay. Let's see how do you share a screen and it's here, share 
and this. So Good. do you see now my slides? Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to speak to you through this webinar. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the French Speaking Society of Neurosurgery and the Neurosurgical uh, Society of Morocco for their kind invitation. I would like to, uh, to congratulate uh, the, the president of the French Speaking Society, Professor Philippe Cornu, for all his dedication in making it possible for all of us to share our passion uh, which, with each other. So I would like also to thank my uh, great friend, uh, Abdesabad El Zahari, uh, for uh, it, it, he is very active in both societies. Uh, he is, uh, it, it is always a great pleasure to share idea with him as well as a photo for, uh, for our respective trips. His work with, uh, I don't know if you can see the photos, but her, uh, her, his work with uh, Naja Al El Abadi and other colleagues is invaluable for the improvement of uh, neurosurgical services in uh, throughout Africa. I must tell you that they have they have an impressive mentor, Professor El Kamishli, uh, who pioneered the establishment of training uh, of African neurosurgeon. Uh, at last year meeting. Uh, in, in Tangier, uh, pres pres presided by uh, Professor El uh, Wahabi, uh, who did a fantastic job, by the way. Professor Hamlishi uh, presented his book entitled, I don't know if you can see the book here, uh, Emerging Neurosurgery in Africa. I highly recommend this book, the super book for anyone who, is, uh, who would like to grasp uh, uh, the evolution of neurosurgery uh, in Africa. So let's get started with, the, with our topic today, uh, brainstem cavernous malformation. Cavern, uh, cavernomas is, uh, surgery for brainstem cavernomas is, is, uh, involves high, uh, highly eloquent area and therefore uh, carries with it a significant uh, or certain, certain risk. My talk today, the goal of my talk today is mainly to dispel fears that some may have in proceeding with such surgery when it is needed. Cavernomas are frequent lesions, often discovered incidentally. Because they are low blood flow system, when they bleed, the hemorrhage is often limited or circumscribed within the lesion. Most patients will improve spontaneously or even recover fully without any kind of intervention. However, however, some patient, if not treated uh, following a bleed, will remain with significant deficit because in fact, bleeding from a brainstem cavernous malformation can lead to permanent severe, severe deficit, neurological deficit, and even death. Is if, if as a surgeon you are not often involved with this kind of pathology, you may be easily misled by the benign nature, the, by, by the benign aspect of this pathology, and not intervene or intervene too late in symptomatic patients. Brainstem uh, surgery for to remove a cavernous malformation is commonplace now, and not as daunting as uh, some may think. The first such surgery was performed by Dandy in 1928. And although only a few large series uh, had been published, uh, this procedure has become popular in recent years and is safer than two, than two years ago. And this is for two main reasons. This is uh, one of the reasons is said you can, See by once, once Buckminster said one day, all major human, he is the, uh, an architect, uh, uh, Fuller Buckminster is an American architect. Once, once he said, all major human revolutions occur in the field of instrumentation. This means technology. Uh, 
So one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why it's safer today, obviously, is because of the technology. You see, by the way, here, uh, Buck, uh, Buckminster Fuller in front of this geodesic dome because he was the one who popularized the geodesic dome. And this, this geodesic dome was built in 1967 in Montreal uh, for the, for the uh, international exposition that, that year. So obviously, uh, in, this, in these uh, case, the technology, uh, what uh, the main the main thing I think is the introduction of uh, Im image guided system. Originally, the surgery were performed uh, when the lesion reaches reaches the surface of the brain stem. With recent advances in technology and with this technology, including uh, including neurophysiological monitoring, we are we are now able to reach deep located or deep sighted lesions. The second reason why it's uh, the, the, it's uh, popularized and it's it's uh, it's also less risky today to operate on these patients is because of the courage of our pioneers. They have shown us that it is possible today to reach deep lesion by using safe entry zones. Those of us who have removed who, who those of us who have removed uh, the uh, brainstem. Uh, uh, cavernous malformation deep in the brain and for the first time can appreciate how courage it need, it, we need to do so. Believe me, every micrometer crossed seem like one kilometer. And, and when you relieve, you, you, you reach the lesion, you feel like you have an idea what eternity is when this is when you first proceed with uh, the surgery. Although the fact remains that surgery comes with major challenges, given the concentration and functional and vital structure in the brainstem. Today, however, it's, it is possible to obtain good surgical results. However, even with the best uh, technology, the most uh, critical factor for good results remain the, the, basic print, the basic principles in surgical technique. It is the way you handle your instruments inside of the, of the brainstem. To safely approach uh, these uh, lesions, I would like to review with you today the basic surgical principles. But first, we, we, should, let, uh, we should look at the indication of and timing of the surgery, two aspects that may, that may at times be very difficult to assess. So what are the indications for surgery? As usual, it depends on the natural, on the one side, the natural history of the, of, the, the, of the disease. What is the risk here? What is the risk of bleeding and the consequences of that bleeding compared to the surgical outcome? Some, while, while it is easier to assess the surgical outcome, it is not so easy to, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, understand the natural history of the disease. And the reason are because in the literature, defining the bleeding is not uniform. Uh, the, when we compare the natural history, are we beginning from the, uh, what, what is the age of the lesion? Is it from the birth? Is it when we first made the diagnosis? And also the recognition of the, uh, of the bleeding is not so easy. Uh, it is difficult sometimes for as, asymptomatic, asymptomatic patient, for patient with, uh, uh, when the images are not so obvious, it's unclear. So you, you can see how it, the, the result may va varies from one study to the other because of these, uh, these problems. So here we, here, this is a, a paper uh, published a uh, uh, few years ago. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's about the, uh, the clinical course of untreated cavernous uh, malformation. And if you retrieve only the, uh, brain, the, in this paper, the patient with brain stem, the risk of hemorrhage, uh, if, 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 the present, if the patient present without an intracranial hemorrhage, the risk in, in the, of a hemorrhage in, uh, after five years is, is about 8% uh, compared to non-brain stem uh, non uh, cavernoma, is, which is 3.8%. However, when the patient presented with an intracranial hemorrhage, Okay, the risk increased uh, 
uh, until uh, to 30.8% per, uh, compared to non-brain stem lesion, which is 18.5%. Per, 18 so what we can see here that the, uh, the, there are two main things we can conclude here that the location of the uh, of the the, the caminous malformation is a is a risk factor, and moreover, the the presentation, uh, the intracranial hemorrhage, or bleeding from a, a cavern a, a, of a cavernoma, is a is a significant risk factor for a rebleeding. With the consequence of uh, each of each bleeding, this is a Dunder study. Uh, from uh, Taslimi and, uh, and colleagues, uh, when you look at the risk of brainstem uh, cavernous malformation, uh, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage uh, annual rate is uh, is about 2.8 percent. But however, once you have bled, the, the rate of hemorrhage is about 32.3 percent. Uh, In some series, it goes on. It, 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 you can see even 60 percent. Most of these patients will recover after the, uh, after the, 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 the hemorrhage. As you can see, following a post uh, hemorrhage, there is a full recovery in 38%. However, if you include all, uh, also the minimal disability, the residual min minimal disability, uh, almost 80% of patients will have a good outcome. But still, this means that 20% of patients will remain with a significant uh, deficit after uh, a bleeding. The mortality rate is uh, is low in, uh, in almost all series. So, what is the risks now of uh, of the surgery uh, with with the uh, with the with the more recent uh, uh, um, uh, series? This is the series from Lawton and his group uh, on 104, uh, 104 patients. The persistent neurological deficit is found in fourteen percent, and the risk factor is the large size of the lesion, the lesion that crossed the midline, the, the presence of a develop, developmental venous uh, uh, anomaly, and, and this is, I think it's an important uh, point, is the greater, uh, greater time interval between the hemorrhage and the surgery, probably because of the scar tissue. And I will show you later a few a uh, few cases where you, you can see the difference, the significant difference between removing uh, uh, a cavernoma when it has recently bleed, bled compared to the, uh, to the one who, uh, who we operate uh, after a few uh, bleeds and so later in the course of the disease. So this is, a, this is the, another uh, systematic review published last last year in the stroke. Uh, this is a large uh, series. The complete resection was uh, more than 90% in that series, and the morbidity was 33.8%. Uh, the, the mortality is low, but still the morbidity is, is, uh, is not uh, negligible. However, most of these patients will improve, and, uh, and, and finally they will be stable and improve uh, in a high uh, rate. And of course, if uh, not of course, but in, according to the study, the rate of rebleeding from a residual lesion is uh, is more than fifty percent, one over two. So this uh, emphasizes the need to do everything we can to uh, to uh, to complete the, the the resection of the of the cavernoma. So what are the indications for uh, surgery? Of course, uh, acute, the acute life-threatening hemorrhage, okay, when the, the patient is uh, become, become uh, comatose, a progressive neurological deficit, multiple hemorrhage, so everybody will agree with that. But I think with, with, now, with the experience now, uh, a hematoma surgical, surgically accessible even if, it's, if it doesn't reach the surface of the brain stem, it's a, it's a, it might be a good indication for surgery in certain patients, okay? Because we know that the, we just have seen that the risk of uh, re-hemorrhage re is, uh, is not negligible. And it's, in fact, it's very high for the first two, uh, at least for the first two, three years. So now let's now jump into the crux of the matter. The, the surgical technique and, uh, and the strategies. 
the most common location of cavernous malformation in the brainstem is the pons. Uh, this is sometimes we see uh, hemorrhage in the, in the, in the, in the midbrain and uh, few in the medulla. The surgery, obviously, the approach obviously depends on the location of the lesion. When the lesion le uh, reaches the surface, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, ob it's more obvious to, to choose the, the type of craniotomy and the site of the craniotomy and the site of the approach. However, when the lesion is deep and there is a need uh, to transgress neural tissue, uh, we must also take into account the safe entry zone. Several entry zones have been described and in general, the lateral zone are less risky than the midline uh, zone, whether, whenever and, uh, whether anterior or posterior. And uh, so I will give you some example. So this is uh, a 36 year old uh, woman who presented with a sudden onset of uh, right hemiplegia, uh, diplopia, speech uh, difficulties and, uh, and, and uh, drowsiness. Several hours after her, uh, uh, she came at the hospital, she become, her level of consciousness uh, 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 was more impaired. And this is because of the hydrocephalus. Uh, she, de she developed this, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, hydrocephalus, uh, as you can see. So after a ventriculostomy, the patient improved, her level of consciousness uh, uh, improved. However, the rest of the neurological deficit remained. And that's the reason. So this is the MRI showing the uh, showing the uh, hemorrhage and the extent of the hemorrhage in in in, in into, uh, towards into the tal uh, the thalamus. So because of the uh, because of the severity of the hemorrhage, because of the severity of the deficit, the patient was young. Uh, we decided to go ahead and to. Uh, to, to go for the surgery, for, for obviously for two, goal, two goals. One is to drain the hematoma and the, and the other is to re, uh, remove the uh, offending lesion. So as you can see here in this, in this, uh, in this, in this images, in this, these images, you can see that the, the hematoma reaches the anterior part of the brainstem. And you still, uh, but there is a, in the posterior, area here, there is, uh, it, it, it doesn't reach the surface of the, uh, the brainstem. However, there is a well-known described uh, a safe entry zone, which is just behind the uh, uh, cerebral peduncle, and, which, uh, and it, it, it has the level of the uh, uh, lateral mesencephalic uh, fissure, where, the, where is the, uh, the lateral mesencephalic vein is, li is uh, lying most of the time. So, how, how do we decide, uh, are we going to approach this lesion from, from, uh, from, uh, from, from, an, from the anterior aspect or with the orbitals, uh, as the uh, orbitofrontal zygotomy or from behind from a supra, uh, for a supra, uh, tentorial, uh, supra cerebellar transtentorial approach? In this case, uh, for, different, for many reasons, we decided to go for this, for, uh, by uh, from the uh, supra, suprasebellar approach, the, one of the reasons, of course, is because of the angle. You you it's you can it's it's very difficult to reach the upper part of the of the hematoma uh, via an uh, anterior approach. Moreover, it's the 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 distance between the hematoma and the safe and at the surface of the entry, safe entry zone is very short, and uh, so. And it, so this is a more direct approach. It's more easy to reach the upper uh, limit of the of the hematoma, and also there is there is no uh, it's not a, a encumbered with so uh, many uh, perforators that you have uh, in the front of the brainstem from the basilar artery. So we use the park bench position to do this. Uh, with the head flexed, the, the craniotomy should should uh, expose the la the inferior aspect of the transverse sinus and the and, and this also the the medial aspect of the uh, sigmoid sinus. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, and and the goal is to reach this safe entry zone, which is 
which is above the, the, trochlear, the trochlear nerve. And again, if because of the hematoma is uh, located uh, high and it, 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 it extends in the, in the thalamus, we, have, we might have to open the, uh, the, uh, the tentorium. So this is the approach. So this is the left suboccipital approach. It's a lateral approach. Uh, it's a lateral approach. So the suprasorebellar approach, we expose the fourth cranial nerve in the cistern. In the, cistern the neural navigator to localize the lesion. It tells us that we have to open the, uh, the tentorium in order to, uh, to uh, gently retract the temporal lo lobe upward. It's very important to uh, open widely the, the cistern. Uh, and as you can see, we, we do a, a large craniotomy and we drain CSF in order not to avoid, uh, to minimize the retraction of the, of the cerebellum. As you can see, there is no retractor on the cerebellum. So once we have uh, identified the site of entry, we, we, we do a very small opening, one millimeter or no, on two, and uh, then the first, the first uh, step is to, uh, to drain the hematoma and then to debulk the lesion. And as you can see with the gentle traction, and this, is, this, is, this seems easy, and the, the reason it's, in fact, it's not so difficult, it's easy to remove it. The reason is because this is a fresh hemorrhage. There is no, almost no scar tissue, and you can see how easy, it, uh, the, uh, how nicely the, uh, the, the, hemat the hematoma and along with the, uh, the cavernoma is coming uh, out, okay? By the way, I like this approach, the supratentorial, uh, supracerebellar transtentorial approach. It's a direct approach. I, I clip the aneurysm, P2 uh, aneurysm. I remove AVM, temporal, medial temporal AVM. I even uh, remove the uh, meningioma in the at on the left uh, atrium. Uh, it's a very nice approach. And as you can see, if you have a lot of room when you relax the brain, uh, the registry bellum, and uh, you don't need any retraction. So we always begin with a very small opening of this of the brain stem, and we and of course this will enlarge as we work. But we we will try to minimize all manipulation and opening of the of the brain stem. Make sure that uh, we everything has been removed and, uh, and closure. So this is the scan the, the day after the surgery, and you can see how the hematoma was uh, was trained. And uh, this is the MRI post op. And I will show you all. I will show you. I will tell you this later again. It's it's so impressive how how fa how quick. Uh, the patient improve after the surgery uh, when you go in the acute stage. And, and it's, it's very understandable because you remove right away the mass effect of the hematoma. And moreover, you don't have to dissect as much uh, because there is almost no scar tissue. So another case, another uh, bleeding, this is a 50, uh, this is a 50 year old uh, female. She presented with uh, uh, also with a uh, uh, dysartria, uh, rapid onset of acute dysartria, uh, a left, left oculomotor paresis, left uh, right paresis, and um, and the dysartria. And uh, as you again, you can see uh, this uh, the the hemorrhage and the MRI showing this uh, hemorrhage, in this uh, cavern, this bleeding inside of a cavernoma. And as you can see in this case, the uh, the, 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 the lesion is a little bit lower, still in the midbrain, but it, uh, a little bit lower than, uh, than the previous case. And in this case, you can see the uh, small amount of, um, of uh, brainstem swelling okay, behind the lesion. And again, once again, the, it seems that in this case, the, uh, the, the lesion reach, reaches uh, the, the, anterior, the anterior surface of the brainstem. In this case, you don't you don't have to. There is no extension in the the thalamus, so you don't need this angle to go uh, upward. So how do you how would you treat this one? So again, 
the comp between the anterior or posterior aspect, I found again the posterior aspect is so direct. So you, it's it's a very short distance. There is no perforators, and uh, in this case, you have to transgress only one uh, one two uh, two millimeters of uh, of uh, neural tissue, and this is uh, the the what we did in this case. Again, the surgery has to be done. Uh, has to be the, 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 we have to dissect above the trochlear nerve. You can see the vein, the lateral mesencephalic vein, the opening of the very small opening of the of the brainstem. Very gentle retraction of the tissue. You no, know, and training the hematoma. First, debulking by draining the hematoma. So the two main things, very important main, th main things in the dissection of these lesions uh, is, uh, is, is sharp, uh, is, is sharp, when you need is a sharp dissect, debulking and sharp dissection and a very small opening and uh, taking, take your time in order to respect the viscoelasticity of the, of the, of the tissue and uh, in this, so this is a, these were two nice examples of acute surgery. Uh, and this, this, these were done in, the less, in a few days after the, the hemorrhage. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so this is the MRI, post-op MRI, uh, which showed the complete resection of the, the AVM. So what would you do with this case? This is a young patient who presented with a Weber, Weber syndrome. Uh, so he had a third uh, a right, Third uh, nerve cranial palsy and uh, right, uh, left hemiplegia, and uh, this is an acute stage. Uh, how would you? The patient is uh, awake, alert, uh, but still he has this uh, motor deficit, the cranial nerve, and the opposite side. Uh, this is an alternate syndrome, the brainstem alternate syndrome, the Weber syndrome. So, how would you approach this? Would you would you wait? Would you go if you go? For surgery, are you going from a, from a, from a anterior aspect or posterior aspect? And as you can see, it it reaches the anterior aspect of the of the uh, of the brainstem. But again, it, there is only a few millimeters from the uh, from the safe entry zone posteriorly. So this is again the approach, and this is the the MRI, the postoperative MRI. Uh, you can see, as it is often the case. The, uh, the, uh, 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 and, uh, the the developmental develop, developmental uh, venous anomaly uh, in the upper portion of the uh, of the lesion. So let's move a little bit lower now. Okay, and this is uh, this is uh, she, she's a forty five year old uh, patient who presented with a with a, a right uh, paresis. And also, uh, which, which was progressive over the last few days, uh, and uh, and uh, you see this, uh, you, we can see we can see this uh, uh, this bleeding at the junction between the uh, the pons and the uh, med medulla on the on the left side. So, so as you can see here, this is at the level of the uh, between the uh, mixed cranial nerve and the seventh cranial nerve, uh, one, uh, one approach in order to remove this lesion is in fr and just behind or at the level of the, uh, uh, ol ol uh, of the olive uh, uh, of what we call the uh, posterior lateral sulcus of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the brainstem, of the medulla. So this means between the, the seventh cranial nerve and anterior, but between the uh, seventh and uh, seventh cranial nerve and the, uh, the mixed cranial nerve medially to these uh, to their output. So again, this is uh, this is uh, in part, we uh, we use the park bench position, the craniotomy. We will work this time a little bit lower, and uh, we will work between these uh, these nerve and the seventh uh, cranial nerve. Okay. 
So very important, at least for me, to really to have to a large craniotomy. Uh, I like large craniotomy to relieve the. You can see the the, the, the lesion at the surface of the brain stem, but this was confirmed with the uh, neural navigator. And again, uh, by opening the you, uh, you you the first thing you do is by draining the hematoma. And we enlarge the, the we enlarge the opening, but the tip of my suction is one millimeter, by the way, so it's a very small opening. And again, uh, you drain the hematoma, and and uh, this patient uh, this patient had a history of uh, of a previous bleeding, uh, may, uh, I think one uh, one year ago, and this I think this is the reason why she had uh, a little bit more of this this, this scar tissue, but still. Uh, we we did, we went to we we performed the surgery in the acute stage, and uh, still we can uh, remove this uh, cavernoma quite easily. Again, it's very important uh, sharp dissection in this situation and to. Uh, no retractor. And again, the suction helped to dissect the lesion. We can see the cavernoma in the middle of that uh, chunk with the, with the scar tissue. And again, the re resection of the lesion. We'll make sure that everything is gone. And this is the post-op. We can see the, uh, the entrance of the, uh, the entrance of the, uh, where we enter, where we remove the, the, uh, the, the cavernoma. Okay, so this is another case and this is, Another case which is a little different from the previous one. And as you can see, this one is much closer to the floor of the fourth ventricle. And the patient, uh, she, she also, she is a, uh, she is a 50 year old. She had also a right hemiparesis. She has a right hemiparesis. She has diplopia uh, and she had the uh, um, hypoesthesia on, the, on the, of, uh, her left uh, if, uh, the left side of her face. How would you approach this lesion? Uh, this time, if you, uh, uh, this is, it's, it's between, it's a little bit, uh, it's a one level level above the previous one. And it, and it reach, it's very close to the, very close to the, to the, the uh, to the uh, surface of the floor of the fourth ventricle. I think, and most will agree with with me, that it's more it's much more dangerous to to go through the uh, fourth ventricle because of the as you know the nuclei are more in the posterior part in the middle of uh, especially the sixth cranial nerve and uh, all the somatic mo uh, motor are just in the midline, um, so uh, so it's very. Uh, challenging and very, I think it's very risky to go through the floor of the uh, of the for, uh, of the fourth ventricle. However, however, there is a, a very nice uh, another nice uh, entry zone just posterior, what we call the uh, lateral lateral pontine uh, safe entry zone, just a little bit lower the uh, the exit of the fifth uh, cranial nerve but in, in more laterally. So we avoid the nuclei of the, of, the, uh, of the fifth cranial nerve. So again, this is in this photo, this is the seventh and eighth cranial nerve, and this is the fifth cranial nerve. So the dissection, you can, appreci uh, you can appreciate the large uh, 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 superior petrosal vein which uh, of course we won't, we will keep it uh, intact during all the procedure. Okay, and wide opening of the, 
of the uh, of the arachnoid, we confirmed uh, we will confirm the location of the lesion with the neural navigator. We are lateral to the uh, dorsal or lateral to the fifth cranial nerve. Very. Sometimes we have to coagulate these small veins, making sure that. Uh, okay, and again, the small opening of the uh, of the brainstem, and uh, the enlarge the enlargement. Uh, we will proceed with the enlargement as 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 less as possible uh, as we work. So draining of the hematoma first, and. And again, the same technique, uh, debulking, and then uh, uh, if, if so, this this was done in an acute stage, and you can see how. So it's amazing how right after the surgery, the patient can see the difference. They they, they feel much better, more, even more alert. Uh, so uh, I think it's. Uh, I think. Uh, when it, whenever it's possible, I think this, these surgeries should be done as soon as possible. Moreover, we, again, we don't have to deal with these uh, scar tissue. I, I like this tweezer to, this is my personal tweezer to remove uh, this kind of lesion. It's very nice, it's, it's very tiny and they, you have a very good control. You don't pull too much with them. And again, so the lateral pontine safe entry zone. Okay, and you see the uh, the resection of the uh, of the cavernous malformation. You see the entrance. Uh, at this level, very close to the floor of the ventricle. The patient improved immediately after the surgery and the uh, patient is doing well. This is a much more difficult uh, case I found, at least I found it much more difficult case. It's a lower portion in the medulla. It's ant anterolateral. This is a young 40, year, 40 years old patient. He bled, before I saw the patient, he bled uh, three times. Uh, each, he, the first time he was hemiplegic on one side, he recovered almost completely after a few weeks. He then became uh, the same year uh, hemiplegic on the other side because of, because of the bleeding. And uh, he recovered from this after a few weeks. And then he had two others uh, mild bleeding with, uh, with, uh, with a very short, uh, uh, with, with, uh, that, that recovered very quickly. So this, this will show you. How, this is a difficult because uh, first, uh, because first, because of the location, it's very anterior. It's the it's a medulla. Medulla. It's uh, it's, it's more tricky. It's uh, all the uh, vital vital uh, uh, pathways are, are located in this area, and uh, and also because of the bleeding, he uh, he has he had much. He has scar tissue. He has a lot of scar tissue. Because of the fourth bleeding, we decided uh, to go ahead and try to remove that lesion. So, this, you, so we have to go anteriorly and low. We decided to go by the retrosigmoid approach. We, we, need, we will need to work in front of the, cranial, uh, of the mixed cranial nerve. We will have the opportunity, opportunity to have two windows, one above uh, this, these nerves or one uh, below. So this is the surgery. Okay. So again, wide opening of the cisterns. And also this will, this help to not only to, uh, to increase the room, but this decrease the need for uh, cerebellar retraction. So you can might see, you can, you might have seen the yellowish discoloration of the brain semi inferiorly to this nerve, the opening of the cistern above the mixed cranial nerve. And when we put the neural navigator, it's, and you can see it, it seems that it's close, the, the lesion is closest at, uh, uh, above the, the nerves. And that's the reason why we decided to, uh, uh, to, uh, to proceed uh, above, these, uh, above these nerves. 
in the retro olivary area. But again, this was very difficult because of the scar tissue. Uh, this, 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 we evacuate the recent bleeding, but the rest of the, of the lesion was uh, very, uh, very thick and very difficult to, uh, to, to dissect. So we had to do this case in two uh, different, uh, two, uh, two stages. First, I, I, I decided to remove by this way first and then uh, I didn't know how much left and uh, I decided to, uh, you know, I didn't know how the, the condition of the patient after the surgery. So I, after I, after I, I spent a few, a, a few time removing this, uh, the, the scar tissue in by this way, I decided to, to discontinue the surgery after having removed most of the, uh, of the cavernoma, I thought at least, and uh, and uh, the, and uh, I, I, so again, you can see the, so you can see how much is difficult. And so this is the second step, because after the, the patient did well after the surgery. However, the MRI was uh, disappointing. So I decided to go ahead and go uh, a few days later for the for the uh, another opening. My, maybe I had I should have done this for the first in first. Uh, Surgery, but I'm not sure if. Uh, okay. At least I had the uh, the MRI, post-operative MRI, to to see uh, the the lesion. And this is the the soft part of the lesion. But again, uh, most of my time was spent to try to remove the uh, the hard, the more the, the harder portion of the uh, of the lesion. Uh, using uh, the mainly the scissors, as you can see. I think this was my uh, I th this was one of my most difficult case in terms of uh, surgical technique because of the location of the lesion and because it was very uh, hard, but still. Uh, this is the post uh, post operative uh, MRI, and you can see main, most of the lesion is gone. But I'm sure there is a, a residual on the more more anterior part of the of the lesion. And as we saw uh, earlier, uh, uh, there is still a risk of bleeding uh, entering his life. So we have to follow carefully this patient. However. For the first time uh, during the this is more than one year now, and he has no uh, no uh, he has there is no more bleeding, uh, and uh, this is the this is the patient playing soccer two uh, less than two months after the surgery, and all win last winter he played hockey according to his uh, to to, to uh, his mother. So uh, this is a very this is a much easier case because it reaches the surface. Of the brainstem, even uh, is uh, and uh, the, the reason why I want to show you it's uh, it's because of the the the, the, sh the using the sharp technique. I think the video is nice to show this. Uh, the, the the even though this is it's a very small at the surface of the uh, at the surface of the brainstem, just to show uh, the the sharp technique where we should use. I think for to remove these lesions. So with the the beaver knife, uh, the uh, and the scissors, circumscribing uh, slowly uh, the, the lesion. So, so this patient presented with uh, uh, proprioceptive deficit uh, on the same side of the lesion. So again, so this is. So this is uh, this is a subacute uh, situation. There is it's 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 soft without being uh, uh, an acute hematoma. And again, this is the post-operative uh, MRI uh, of this patient with complete resection. But this is a straightforward straightforward uh, straightforward case. This is another case which is a little bit more difficult because of the location of the lesion. Uh, um, because it goes deeper in the in the brainstem, and it goes anteriorly, and and uh, you, we have to approach this from the midline, 
uh, safe entry zone. But again, this lesion uh, reaches the surfaces, uh, the surface of the brain stem, which make it easier to uh, to uh, to reach. And this is the post-operative. The patient didn't uh, suffer from any. There is no. Uh, uh, he had a previous pre uh, before the surgery. He had proprioceptive. Uh, proprioceptive deficit, and he kept his deficit without uh, no aggravation of his of his neurological condition. He is doing uh, very well right now. Uh, I cannot leave the the surgical technique without showing at least uh, the the the, the uh, telovelo. Uh, telovelar approach to remove a cavernoma. Uh, Okay, because of course we try to avoid any resection of the of the brain tissue. So we uh, we uh, I have never opened. I think in my life I, for reach a lesion, I never opened the vermis of the. I never cut a vermis to reach a lesion, uh, not to my memory. And so the telovelar approach, you can see the uh, the tela corrida. Soon you will see the choroid plexus. When I was reviewing that uh, video, I saw a lot of tremors. So I asked to my fellows, which of uh, of my which one was uh, involved with me during that surgery. And uh, one of my fellow quickly, uh, after having uh, looking at the day, well, when was the performed the surgery, he quickly answered. Uh, and tell me that he couldn't be him because that day he was left-handed. So, <laughs> so you, you see the choroid plexus attached to the uh, telacoroida at the inferior, inferior uh, part of the roof of the fourth ventricle. As you can see the movement of the of the retractor because it's very it's soft, it's not very tight, the retractor. And you see the, the lesion, sharp dissection as much as you can. In fact, this video was, uh, this the surgery was performed, I think, uh, almost 10 years ago. Again, Of course, we we try to keep the uh, the tissue uh, the hemosiderin laden tissue. We we keep the this tissue in place. This is a protection for the for the normal tissue. So we leave. Uh, we do not remove the uh, gliosis uh, surrounding uh, the uh, the cavernoma. And it's not. And you, ha you can see, uh, this is the uh, aqueduct. You can see how the aqueduct is flowing. And this is the floor of the fourth ventricle. And the patient uh, went very well. And this, uh, the, the last case is to, is this patient became uh, quadriplegic. And uh, she developed a, a, a rapidly progressive uh, quadriplegia. The, the morning of the surgery, she was, she had even trouble to, to, to breathe. So uh, we went uh, in the operating room urgently. And uh, again, this is from the midline approach. And this is the after the surgery, uh, the case. The patient, again, improved immediately after the surgery. Uh, she was not able to move at the complete one side. At, right after the surgery, she, she could move uh, uh, one side of her body. And this is the, the reason because we, we relieve immediately the pressure on the neural structure. And I cannot believe that this will make, this won't make the difference in the outcome of the patient. So this is, a, I took this, uh, this uh, a very short series of cases done during the last, in the, in, during the period of 18 months. The patient operated uh, very early. This means less than 40 days. And as you can see, most of these patients improved after the, the surgery. Uh, in fact, except for one patient, uh, 
uh, one patient uh, stayed stay the same, but all the others improved. Uh, two patients uh, had a small temporary, uh, at, for one patient, temporary deficit, and the other is a, a temporary a sensory deficit. And the, uh, so one kept this deficit for a while, then he recovered completely, and the other one uh, uh, stayed with this deficit, but it was not impairing his uh, quality of life. Right. So, in conclusion, so brainstem cavernous malformation, uh, the, the rebleeding rate of, uh, uh, of uh, brainstem cavernous malformation is very high. And today, uh, we can have good surgical uh, results even for uh, deep uh, located lesions. I think that patient may be benefit from being operated on earlier, earlier than uh, later. Uh, because of the tissue, and, uh, in, and this uh, again, this was the risk factor in the, the Latin series. Uh, if you operate late uh, compared to op uh, uh, for surgery performed uh, very early after the surgery, uh, after the, the hemorrhage, whether it is, it is earlier or later, the basic important principles are an appropriate approach and adequate exposure. Precise entry site, especially when cavernoma, the cavernoma is not visible at the surface. And this, the, uh, the neural navigator is uh, extremely important here. This, a small, the smallest opening of the brainstem and the progressive enlargement of the, of the opening as uh, we work. And again, uh, we, we, we cannot overemphasize the, the use of the sharp dissection 